How should you respond to the threat of wildfire? The full answer to this requires knowledge about wildfire behavior, which is affected by the science of fire, the terrain, weather, and fuel. Hi, I'm Mark Brown, the Executive Officer for the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority, and I'm going to explain these factors so you can make well-informed decisions to stay safe. So let's start with fire itself. For fire to occur, three things must be present, and we call that the fire triangle. You remove any one leg of that fire triangle and the fire goes out. The first component of the fire triangle is oxygen. We have oxygen all over, but if you remove oxygen, maybe by putting water on the fire and, and separating the oxygen from the fuel, the fire goes out. And then we have heat. You need heat to start the fire and then heat to transfer the fire. So let's talk about the three different ways that heat transfers during a fire. The first one is conduction, and that is when a flame hits the fuel it is next to. That's called conduction. And then we have convection. We know that hot air rises. And as you sit in front of your campfire and you see all the embers going straight up into the air, that's what we call convection. And the last form of heat transfer is called radiation. I'll go back to the campfire uh, example. When you're sitting by the campfire and you got your hands and you're warming your hands up at the campfire, that's from radiation. And then the last leg of that uh, fire triangle is fuel. And that's the grass, the brush, the trees, and sometimes, unfortunately, homes. And if you remove that fuel, maybe it's from using our hand tools, cutting a, a line down the mineral soil, that's removing the fuel so when the fire hits that, the fire goes out. So we talked about the fire triangle. Now we're gonna talk about the wildfire behavior triangle that includes weather, terrain or topography, and fuel. One of the components of, the, of weather is temperature. Temperature actually has very little effect on the wildfire triangle, except on how the temperature can decrease or increase humidity, which we're gonna talk about later. One of the most important things we need to talk about when it comes to weather is the wind. First of all, wind increases the supply of oxygen to the fire, which can make the fire burn more intensely. And wind also influences the direction and the spread of the fire. Think about the flames coming up and wind pushing those flames down and elongating them. That allows for more contact for the fuels ahead of the fire and it really pushes the fire that direction. It's also the wind that picks up those embers into the air and moves them forward, landing in front of the fire and making it spread that much faster. Wind also carries away the moisture from the fuels. Think about doing your laundry and putting them out on a clothesline. The wind blows through your clothes and dries your clothes out. That's exactly what happens with the fuels out there. And then the most important wind that we need to talk about is what we call Diablo winds around here, right? And the, the real name is a fern wind, which is German for dry mountain wind. And these winds start in the northeast corner of our state at high elevations, and they move towards Marin and they're shaped by the terrain. And on average, for every 1,000 feet that that air drops, the temperature increases three degrees, which decreases the relative humidity. So by the time the wind gets to Marin, it is a very hot and dry wind that can create explosive and extreme fire behavior. And the last component of weather that we're gonna talk about is relative humidity. Relative humidity is an important concept to understand because it is a determining factor in wildfire risk. Relative humidity tells us how much water is contained in the air relative to its capacity. Think about it this way. Let's say that an air mass has a certain amount of water in it, but it's not filled to its capacity. This bubble is about 80% full. So it has a relative humidity of 80%. Now imagine that the temperature gets hotter but the amount of moisture doesn't change. Hotter temperatures make the air mass expand. So now that same amount of water only takes up about 40% of the bubble. So the relative humidity went down to 40%. Low relative humidity is felt as a dry day. Here in Marin, dry days often happen in the summer when the relative humidity is around 20 to 30%. These can be days where fire risks are higher. 
But dry days also happen in the winter. Think of how dry your hands feel on those cold and dry days. This happens when dry air masses bring in less moisture and the relative humidity goes down. Wildfires can start and spread quickly on these cold, dry days. The takeaway is that relative humidity is an important factor in determining risk. You can relax a bit when the fog is in the air or the dew is on the ground because these are signs that the relative humidity is high. But be on guard when the relative humidity goes below 30%. All right, so now let's talk about topography or the terrain of our land. The first component we're gonna talk about is called aspect. And that is which way the slope is facing. So what we call a south aspect is that slope that is facing to the south. Those slopes tend to get the most sun during the day, so they tend to be that drier slope. Compared to the north slopes, they get less sun during the day. And if you look out at the terrain, you're gonna notice that we have mostly grass and lighter fuels on the southern aspects because of that heat. Whereas when you get to the northern aspects, you're gonna see more heavier fuels, the timber. And remember, um, I, I remember when I was a kid, I was taught if you wanted to figure out which way was north, you look at the trunk of a tree and the side of the tree that had more moss was north. And that's because there's less temperature and the moss can survive on that. Then we have our west aspect. That's the, the part of the slope that gets sun the latest, but it's also had sun on it almost the longest. So when we get late in the afternoon, a lot of times that west slope, combined with our onshore uh, wind flow that we get, that can be some of the most dangerous slopes we have. And then we have the east slope. Those are the slopes that get sun the earliest, they heat up the soonest, but they don't really get a chance to get to those higher temperatures and lower humidities. And so that tends to impact fire behavior. The next component is slope. The steeper the slope, the more likely the fire is gonna move up that slope. So let's consider a flat piece of land and we have the flames coming straight up. You can see that as the flames go up, they are touching the fuels, both radiant heat wise and conductive the same. But now when you put the slope like this and you have your flames like this, these flames are much closer to the, the fuels to the t above them than they are below them. So therefore the fire wants to burn up slope. And then also during the day, as the hot air warms up, it wants to go up slope. So you have the combination of the flames being closer to the vegetation and the wind pushing that heat up the slope. And what's also important for us is the position of, of the fire on the slope. When a fire starts at the top of the slope, there's a lot less potential for that fire because it wants to burn up slope as opposed to burning down slope. When a fire starts in the middle of the slope, we know that it wants to burn uphill, but we also have the problem that materials can roll down the slope, a log that gets broken loose or something. And now it brings that fire all the way down to the bottom of the slope. And when we have a fire at the bottom of the slope, that's where it has the most potential to run, create even that much energy. And that's the convective heat that could create little embers that are gonna go over the ridge and cause problems. So for the most part, fire wants to burn uphill, but sometimes downslope winds can be so strong, and those are the fern winds or the Diablo winds that it will actually push fire downhill. And then the last component, and one of the most important components of our terrain is its actual shape. We have ridges, we have wide canyons, we have narrow valleys or little drainages or chimneys as we call them on the sides of the slopes. And the reason why we call them chimneys is they draw the heat up the slope just like your chimney does in your fireplace at your house. Think about these, these uh, chimneys, like if you were to take a big pitcher of water and pour it on the land, the same way the water would want to go down the land through those chimneys is the exact same way the fire wants to burn up it. Or if there's that downslope wind, it's going to interact with that terrain and it's going to get funneled down with that. So whenever we have wind aligned with a big canyon, valley, drainage, the intensity of the fire is going to be even stronger in that area. 
And now we're moving on to the last leg of the wildland fire triangle, and that is fuel. And let's understand that we cannot influence weather. We cannot influence the terrain. There is only one component of the wildland fire triangle that we can influence, and that is fuel. We've broken up the, uh, the, wild, or the fuel component into several pieces. We have grass, brush, timber, logging slash, which isn't really what we have here in Marin, but if you think about sudden oak death and all the trees that have fallen down onto the forest floor, that is considered logging slash. And then we have a new fuel, and that's homes. We really do need to consider homes as a component, a fuel component to wildland fire. Now, what is really important about the fuels is the moisture that they hold. And we have live fuels and we have dead fuels. We monitor both every day throughout the fire season so that we can gauge what the relative fire behavior is for that day. Live fuel moisture, as, a grass, as the brush or the grass grows, it usually has a lot of moisture in it. And then when it starts going into the dormancy, even live fuels, their moisture will go down. We have a spot up on Mount Tam that where we monitor the live fuel moisture. When we monitor live fuel moisture, we use chemise as our fuel sample. We cut the trimmings from a plant, we place them into a can, and then we weigh it. Then we place the can in a kiln overnight, then we reweigh it. This tells us how much of the plant's weight was moisture, and therefore we know the live fuel moisture percentage. During the spring, most of the plant's weight is actually the moisture it holds. During the summer, it can drop dramatically. For us in Marin, when that brush gets to 60% live fuel moisture, we are at critical levels. It used to be that we wouldn't hit 60% until September. Last few years, we have been hitting 60% fuel moisture in August. And now let's talk about dead fuel moisture. Probably the most important fuel moisture content for wildland firefighters because it's the dead fuels that really drive fire. Nature really is always trying to seek a balance. So it's trying to balance the amount of moisture, that relative humidity we talked about in the air with the moisture that is in the dead fuels. And so we've created categories of dead fuels that describe the moisture content and how fast that moisture content changes. We have one hour fuels. Those are the fuels that are the dead grasses, the twigs. They're less than a quarter inch in diameter. One of the ways I can tell how dry that dead fuel is, is that if I'm walking and I hear crunching underneath my feet, I know that moisture is low in that dead fuel. And so the reason why we call it one hour fuels is that in one hour, the moisture that's in this fuel is trying to balance out with the moisture in the air. If the air is drier in one hour, that moisture is gonna leave the fuel. If the air has more moisture than the fuel, in one hour, that moisture is gonna go into the fuel. Then we get into our 10 hour fuels. Those are the sticks that are a little bit bigger on the forest floor. They are a quarter inch to one inch in diameter. And again, one of the ways I can tell how dry that is, is that if I break that stick and I hear it crack, I know it's dry. And so it's the same thing we talked about with the one hour fuels. With the 10 hour fuels, in 10 hours, that moisture is trying to balance out with the moisture that's in the air. So if the air is drier, the moisture is leaving the fuel, going into the air. If the air has more moisture, then it goes right back into the fuel. So now you see that the one hour and 10 hour fuels can really change during the day, right? The grass is going to dry out just about every day and be available to burn. The 10 hour fuels, most days it's gonna dry, especially when we have those hot dry periods of four days or longer, that those 10 hour fuels are gonna be very dry. Then we get to the 100 hour fuel. Those are the, the pieces of fuel that are one inch to three inches in diameter. So it is 10, 100 hours or nearly four days, more than four days for that moisture to leave the fuel to go into the air or for it to go from the air to the fuel. And in the thousand hour fuels, those are three to eight inch borderline logs, right? Sitting on the forest floor. It takes 40 days 
for that moisture to leave the fuel to go into the air or vice versa. So now you can see that during a hot, dry summer, they can really get dry. And then if you compound that with a drought, they've had years of drying. So one strong rain season is not putting that moisture back into those thousand hour fuels. So that's why we historically have uh, catastrophic fire seasons following a drought busting rain year. Now let's talk about residents applying water to their properties or their homes before an approaching wildfire. Think about the one hour time fuels or time lag to 10 hour time lag. It really isn't, you can see that it's not effective putting the water on the fuel before the fire comes because either the water's gonna evaporate before the fire gets there and it didn't have time to penetrate into the fuel. And then when you spray your house, what are houses designed to do? They're designed to shed water. So as you spray that house, the water is gonna hit the house, run down on the ground, and now your house isn't any safer. You would be better served evacuating rather than applying water to your property. So we've talked about the wildland fire triangle, weather, terrain or topography, and fuel. And we understand that fuel is the only component that we can impact. So what does that mean to you and your responsibility to manage the fuel that is on your property? We hope that this little talk about wildfire behavior has made you more well-informed to manage the fire smart landscaping on your property and to make better decisions before a fire ever comes. And we also hope that this is, will help you increase your situational awareness about the environment around you. Is it that hot, dry, windy day? Have you seen the red flag alerts? That should make you more situationally aware, more prepared to evacuate. You might even have your go bag by your front door ready to go. And then you're in tuned to anything that's going on around you. Knowing that maybe a fire had just started near your home or a fire is several miles from your home, but maybe burning towards your home. So you could be situationally aware and understand if there's a risk to you. Or maybe it's that drippy, wet, foggy day. You don't have to be as concerned. And then let's talk about evacuations. I hope through this talk that you can understand we want you to evacuate downhill. Going uphill away from the fire is dangerous. That's where firefighters die. We hear a lot of people wanting to use fire roads. Most fire roads lead uphill away from the communities. That puts you in the most dangerous spot. Fire roads also tend to go through canyons and drainages the most dangerous parts of a fire where the fire is burning with most intensity. So please use this situational awareness to evacuate early when you receive that notification, stay on paved roads and go downhill. Thank you and please be fire safe.